Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new to my channel, hello. My name is Gabby and welcome. If you've never been here before, I cover true crime cases and all the cases that I cover here on my channel are a little bit older. They're more on the vintage side. They're all basically 20 years or older. So if that's something you might be interested in, maybe go down below and click that subscribe button. And also turn on the post notifications and set it to be notified every time that I upload and you will be notified every time that I upload. <laughs> the only thing that you have to remember about my channel is that I upload at weird times. Sometimes I'll upload on a Sunday like today and sometimes I'll upload on a Wednesday or a Friday. You never really know when I'm gonna upload and that is because of cases like the one that I'm covering today where I might just wanna spend a little bit of extra time on the case to make sure that I have all the correct information and that the video is exactly how I want it. The case that I'm going to be discussing in today's video has definitely been very heavy on my heart and I just want to make sure that I do her story justice. I was also fortunately able to speak to one of the family members of the main victim that the story revolves around. It's actually the family member that without them, this victim would not have been identified. There have been huge recent updates in this case. This is the case of Beth Doe. This story starts off in White Haven, a borough in Lucerne County, Pennsylvania. The year was 1976. On December 20th of that year, under the Interstate 80 overpass by the bank of the Lehigh River, a spine-chilling scene was stumbled upon by a teenage boy. Kenneth Jumper Jr. was 14 at the time when during one of his walks along the river saw what looked like a human head laying next to some luggage. He ran home to tell his older brother, Richard, who was 19 at the time, and the police were phoned immediately. When authorities arrived to the area where the head was seen, all in all, two remains were found, the body of a female and the body of a nearly full-term fetus. That in itself is enough to scar anyone for life, but it's the way they were found that left everyone speechless. The female was guessed to be a teenager, and her body had been cut into a total of 10 pieces, with her torso itself cut into two, and it had been determined that her female fetus had been removed from her body before this dismemberment began. The 10 pieces of her body and the body of her unborn baby were put into three separate suitcases. Two of the suitcases were a shade of blue with a red, white, and blue stripe on them, and the third was tan with a plaid design. All three suitcases were the same type of material and roughly the same size, but the strangest part is that they had all been spray painted black and were missing their handles. The coroner determined that the two had died less than 24 hours before their bodies were located, but some considered that they may have been dead for up to a week considering the weather outside. It had been freezing temperatures in the area with snow on the ground for days. This could have helped preserve the remains. They did know though that it was most likely not over a week's time because the boy who found the remains stated that he had just been in that area exactly a week earlier and the suitcases were not there then. When it came to the dismemberment of the female's body, it was determined she had been sawed with a serrated tool. If you're familiar with say the case of the Black Dahlia, you might remember that they determined that she had been cut by someone who definitely had some sort of medical training in cutting someone open or into pieces. This was not like that at all. It was not sloppily done, but they certainly were not trained in the field of medicine or anatomy. The first suitcase contained the victim's torso that had been cut into two pieces. The second suitcase contained her arms and her legs, and the third suitcase contained her head and her unborn baby. The victim's nose, ears, and breasts were all cut off, and they were never able to locate them. It was guessed that possibly the killer had kept them as some sort of twisted souvenir. It did look like she had been cut up on her face in an attempt to make her unrecognizable to whoever stumbled upon the remains, but besides her missing nose, it was pretty easy to tell what she had looked like while she was alive. This Jane Doe was eventually given the name Beth Doe. As they were performing the required tests on the victim's remains, the more they found out, the more tragic this story became. Beth Doe had also been sexually assaulted, and this was easy to tell based on the trauma to her genital area. 
but they were not able to tell if she had been sexually assaulted before or after she was murdered. Her overall cause of death was strangulation, but after she was killed, she had also been shot in her neck. This was most likely the killer's way of making sure she was actually dead. It is believed that the suitcases were thrown out of a moving vehicle, and based on the way they landed, authorities determined that the vehicle was headed west along the interstate. Whoever threw them out of the moving vehicle probably was hoping that they would land in the river, but two of the suitcases landed a little to the side in the surrounding brush and popped open upon impact. It was about 300 feet from the overpass to the area below, so it would have been very easy for them to open after hitting the ground so hard. The suitcases that opened were the one containing her torso and the one containing her head and her fetus. The pieces of her body and the body of her unborn baby were not just thrown in the suitcases though. The suitcases also contained packing foam, straw, a reddish orange chenille flower bedspread, and very soggy newspapers. The newspaper was eventually determined to be the New York Sunday from the date of September 26, 1976, and came from the northern part of New Jersey. Many thought finding the area where the newspaper came from would help the case, but it didn't get them anywhere closer to finding out who the girl was or who was responsible for her murder. Now, this murder was horrific, to say the least. When it comes to a murder this vile, authorities will most likely consider that it had to have been done by someone who knew the victim. Someone who knew the victim personally and had a lot of anger towards them. Someone like, say, an ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend or someone they may have owed money to. Something along those lines. And that's what authorities figured in this case. It had to have been someone who had something against this poor girl. Beth Doe, like I said before, was guessed to be in her teenage years. Some did think that she could have been in her early 20s, but most people did think that she was in her mid to late teenage years. She was also determined to be between four feet, 11 inches tall and five feet, four inches tall. She weighed about 140 to 150 pounds due to her pregnancy. They were unable to determine exactly how much she may have weighed if she wasn't pregnant. She had brown shoulder length hair that had been undyed and brown eyes. Her blood type was type O. She also had some distinct characteristics to her, such as an extremely visible scar above her right heel and two prominent moles on her face, one above her left eye and one on her left cheek. When it came to her teeth, there was definitely a lot going on, a lot that they had to take note of. She had no false teeth, but there had been a bit of work done. She had some molars extracted. These extractions definitely happened before she hit her teenage years. She had received some fillings in the past and many of her teeth at the time of death had suffered from some sort of decay. One of her front teeth also had a fracture. From the decay to the fracture, her teeth were most likely causing her some sort of pain on the regular while she was alive. She also had writing on her left palm that was done in ink. It was done in pen and it had the letters WSR and then the number four or five and then followed by another number thought to be either a four or seven. Authorities were unsure what this writing meant and they still don't really know to this day, but if she had written it herself, this meant that she was right-handed and that was another small characteristic that they could add to their list of this Jane Doe's characteristics. This was 1976 though, keep that in mind. So their technology was far less advanced than ours in today's time, but they did everything they could at the time to try to identify the girl. They fingerprinted her and made a dental chart of her teeth. Her fingerprints were compared to fingerprints in the FBI database and there was no match. They looked into missing persons reports from all over the United States and even Canada, but did not come across any that could have matched their Jane Doe. Weeks turned into months, and as time went on, their hope was lessening. They continued to spread the word of the case and run their main sketch of the victim in the newspapers, but all the leads that came in never really led them anywhere. 
They figured that their victim was most likely not from the area and possibly not even from the state of Pennsylvania at all. The case was listed in police files as incident number N3-27244. One of the very first leads in this case was when a newspaper article from the Boston Globe was sent to authorities who were working on this case. This article was dated the 16th of December of 1976 and highlighted a recent case where a school teacher went missing from a motel room and this motel room was discovered she was gone from the motel room and it was covered in blood. This story did grab their attention, but this woman would not end up being their doe because this woman would end up being found deceased that April in a wooded area in Massachusetts, the same state that she went missing from. Beth Doe and her unborn baby's remains were kept in the Philadelphia city's morgue for a few years, hoping promising leads would come in and they would eventually be able to locate the family and ship the remains to where she was from. But in 1983, they finally decided to bury them in in Lorytown Road Cemetery in Carbon County, Pennsylvania. Then as technology advanced, they eventually decided to exhume her remains in the year of 2007. They obtained more forensic information for the case and also they were able to construct an updated facial reconstruction of her. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children would release two main facial reconstructions of Beth Doe with their second and latest one being in mid 2015. Through the years, they worked tirelessly to try to identify her. And of course, one of the main ways was going through lists of missing girls around that area. They were able to eventually rule out 12 missing girls as being their doe, some from New York, some from Tennessee, Kentucky, Massachusetts, New Jersey, California, Vermont, Florida, and even one all the way in Australia. During the year of 2019 though, they really did think they found their girl when a tip came in to the Pennsylvania State Police that September. For a period of time, a very brief period of time, they thought that Beth Doe could have been a missing girl named Madeline Maggie Cruz. The person calling said that the sketches looked a lot like Maggie did in the 70s, that Maggie in 1974 lived with a foster family in Massachusetts and at the age of 16 ran away with her foster sister to Terrytown, New York. But a week later, the foster sister returned without Maggie. It was said that about two years later in 1976, Maggie phoned a friend saying she needed money and was pregnant at the time. People who knew Maggie from that area said that they never saw her again. So when you think about it, there was this girl who was missing from up in the northeastern part of the United States, and she was said to be pregnant in 1976, and no one had supposedly seen her since that year. This seemed pretty promising to authorities. Could this be, finally, their huge breakthrough in the case? Well, it wouldn't be, because Maggie Cruz was found alive and well later that month, which, of course, that's seriously incredible, but still, that leaves them with the question, who is Beth Doe? In the year 2020, just last year, they entered Beth Doe's DNA into a DNA database, where they were able to locate one of her family members, and this would be her nephew, which was her brother's son. They talked to this nephew, and this nephew was able to put them in direct contact with other family members so they could do a final DNA test comparing this Jane Doe's DNA to this family's DNA. On Wednesday, March 31st of 2021, it was released to the public that Beth Doe has been identified after 44 years. Beth Doe finally got her name back and she was 15 year old Evelyn Colon of Jersey City, New Jersey. Evelyn Colon was born on April 17th of the year 1961. Her family refers to her as their hazel green eyed beauty. Authorities spoke to Evelyn's family and they had a lot to say. Evelyn's brother told authorities that his sister had went missing in 1976 when she was roughly eight to nine months pregnant. Evelyn's family also gave authorities the name of who they think is the person responsible for her and her unborn baby's death. This person is named Louis Sierra, who went by the name Wiseau and was 19 years old in December of 1976. 
Lewis and Evelyn were together. They were dating. Lewis was the father of their unborn baby, and the two lived in an apartment together during the later part of 1976. Evelyn's family said that Lewis was controlling, jealous, and abusive towards Evelyn, that she spent most of her time inside, almost like she feared going anywhere, and she also told her mother that if anything ever happened to her, that it was Lewis's fault, that they should immediately look at him. The family told authorities that in December of 1976, Evelyn asked her mother if she could drop by some soup because she wasn't feeling too well. Evelyn's mother went by the apartment to drop off this soup sometime later, and when she got to the apartment, it was completely vacant. The family stated that they never saw Evelyn again. But they did say that in January of that next year, which would have been about a month after Evelyn vanished and about a month after her body was found, but of course, them in New Jersey didn't know that her body had been found in Pennsylvania. They said that they received a very strange letter and that this letter was made to look like it had been written by Evelyn. The letter had a postmark from Stanford, Connecticut, and it was written in Spanish. The letter stated that Evelyn and Lewis had moved to Connecticut, that Evelyn had ended up delivering the baby, and they named the nine pound baby Lewis Sierra Jr. The letter said that if she needed anything, she would eventually reach out. The family claimed that this was the reason they never reported Evelyn missing. Unfortunately, this very blurry photo of Evelyn is one of very few that we have of her in today's time due to the fact that a fire years ago had destroyed a lot of the family's personal photos. After authorities learned about all of this, it was obviously time for them to track down Louis Sierra, and they did. At the end of March, they found him, 63 years old, living in Ozone Park, which is a neighborhood in Queens, New York. Authorities arrived at his home and arrested him in connection to Evelyn Cullen's death. They started questioning him about Evelyn, and of course, he immediately denied any involvement in her murder, and he even had the audacity to claim that he did not know who she was. He eventually, though, cracked a little and said that they did date and that she was far along in her pregnancy with their child. He did start loosening up a little and giving a bit more information, but it's information that authorities simply do not believe. Lewis, according to court records, stated that in December of 1976, Evelyn said to him that she was going to leave him and that one day he got home and she was simply gone. Lewis stated that he thought that she had went back home to live with her mother. He himself said that he went back to live with his father. So he is basically telling authorities that his nearly nine month pregnant girlfriend randomly left one day. So they asked him if he ever reached out to contact her in any way or try to see his child after she was supposed to have given birth. And he said he did go to her mother's home a few times, but no one answered. And then he said he just stopped trying. He couldn't really give a solid answer as to why he apparently tried so little to see Evelyn or his child that would have been born in January of 1977. When it came to the letter, they did of course question him about that. He stated that he and Evelyn had taken a day trip to Connecticut to look at apartments, and that's when he wrote the letter to her family. He said he would have liked to have named their child Louis Sierra Jr. if the baby was a boy, but he claimed he didn't remember writing that in the letter because he said, why would he have written that if the baby wasn't Born yet. Authorities then brought up a really good point, and they brought up the fact that the letter was written out and received by Evelyn's family after Evelyn had been found murdered and dismembered in Pennsylvania. And Lewis didn't really know how to respond to this. Authorities, though, think that they know why, because he was the one responsible for their deaths. He is currently being charged with criminal homicide. He is being held without bail and will eventually be extradited back to 
Pennsylvania. Now that is the main bit of information released to the public about this case, but like I said at the beginning of this video, I was thankfully able to speak directly to Evelyn's nephew, the nephew whose DNA helped identify her, and he was kind enough to speak to me about the case and answer some of my personal questions regarding it. Her nephew's name is Lewis Cullen Jr. and one of the first things that I asked him was what was his initial reaction to the news? The news of discovering what happened to his aunt and discovering what happened to his cousin. In which he said, my reaction was wow, is this really it? I purposely uploaded my DNA to multiple sites to locate her or my cousin. I heard the story growing up that she left to be with her boyfriend and her kid and said that when she was ready, she would reach out to the family. Well, it was all a lie. I always felt some type of connection to her. I would think of her story every year we got together for the holidays and always wondered, where is she? Why doesn't she want to be a part of our family? I knew that my cousin would be about seven years older than me. So with the new technology, I felt I may be able to find one of them. If not now, then maybe in the future one day if they uploaded the DNA, it would match and I could then find out why she decided to leave. I then asked him about Evelyn and Lewis, how they met and a little bit about their relationship. He told me that they had met because Lewis lived in the neighborhood when she lived with her family. They started a relationship and she became pregnant at an early age. That back then things were different. It's not like how it is in today's time. And he said that usually if you became pregnant by your significant other, you would move in with them. And that's what she did. He said that it's hard to judge by today's standards, but back then that was normal. He said, after she moved out, my grandmother would stay in touch with them both. One day my aunt wanted soup. She went over to bring it and no one was home. The neighbor said that they had moved out. My grandmother went all over Jersey City looking for her. She went to his family and they told her that they moved to Connecticut and not to worry. A few weeks later, she gets a letter basically saying that she gave birth to a boy, Lewis Jr., and don't worry, she will reach out when she's ready. As we know though, she didn't give birth to a boy, it would have been a girl, and this letter was sent after both were already dead. Now, a lot of people out there might wonder why the family never reported her missing. He said, why didn't they report her missing? They all thought she went willingly and wanted to start her new life with him as a family. That was the mentality of some people back then. They want to start new and they leave to a new place. When they got the letter, they really believed it, even though it broke my grandmother's heart. My grandmother did try to find her, but didn't involve the police as how is she missing if she left with him and she said she would contact us if she wanted to reach out. It's very easy for people to judge my grandmother as if she just didn't care, but she did. He said that he remembers when he was a child and that his grandmother would sit in her chair and would talk about Evelyn and cry about Evelyn and wonder why Evelyn didn't want to be a part of the family. Evelyn's nephew said that since this news broke that even he has judged himself about why he never went to police, but he was always told growing up that she had left on purpose. All in all, he ended it by saying, what I want everyone to know is she was loved. Unfortunately, due to the era, no social media, stereotypes, he was able to get away with it, but her future nephew didn't give up. I've been highly invested in this case lately. I've been researching everything about the Beth Doe case before she was identified and also trying to just piece together everything and learn a little bit more about Evelyn as a person. So I was going to talk about this case on my channel no matter what, but I especially wanted to cover it now because the family is asking for help from the public. Evelyn's family is wanting to transport Evelyn and her unborn baby girl's remains to a cemetery closer to where Evelyn was from, give the two a proper headstone and pay for a memorial service for the two. So they started a GoFundMe page. The organizer of the page writes, Beth Doe has a name. She is Evelyn Colon. After 45 years of desperate searching, our beloved Evelyn and her baby girl have been found through her nephew's DNA match. The hopes of one day reuniting with her were long etched in our hearts. 
She was taken from a family who loved her and a family longing to meet her and her child for the first time. We never could have imagined this would be the way we would see her again. The gruesome brutality of Evelyn and her baby's murder have deeply broken us. We are currently deciding baby names that Evelyn would have given to her baby girl. Her nephew did say that whatever they do not make from the fundraiser, if they do need a little bit more money to cover everything, that they will be making up the difference. But if you do want to donate, I will have the page linked below in the description of this video. Now this is all very fresh information in the media. Much more information will be coming out regarding this case in the future. And of course, we will eventually see the outcome of a trial when it comes to Luis Sierra. From what I read, when they tracked down Luis Sierra, he had a wife and two kids, I guess, that are fully grown in today's time. And I did read from the New York Daily News that they did question one of his neighbors and this neighbor said that they were stunned about the arrest and that they felt, I guess, sorry for him, that they always knew him as a good guy and that he may have been bad back then, but they don't see that. In him. But honestly, that's usually how it goes because most people who see the evil side of someone are not usually a random person living next door, but someone close to the person, or in some cases, no one who knows the person sees their evil side and they just do these evil things at random to random individuals. It's different with every case, but I guess my point is that you can never really judge a book by its cover. If you want to keep up with any updates in Evelyn's case, make sure to follow facebook.com slash Carbon County Beth. I have spoken to one of the admins of the page myself, and they are definitely on top of this case and making sure to keep people updated in any way that they can. The latest and very latest update on this case that I do have for you all is that the family has finally decided on a name for Evelyn's baby, and they have decided to name her Emily Grace so all in all, that is the case of Beth Doe and her unborn baby, better known as Evelyn Colon and Emily Grace Colon. Like I've made quite clear in this video, I am highly invested in this case and it is a case that I definitely see myself in the future doing a part two of. Once more information comes out about Evelyn, the case itself, and we see an outcome to what happens with Luis Sierra and if he goes to prison for what he is being charged for and accused of, I will definitely do another part to this case. I do want to say at the end of this video, thank you again to her nephew for being so kind and texting with me and answering all of my questions so thoroughly. I hope that at the end of it all, justice can be served in your aunt and cousin's case. Also, a thank you to my viewers for taking a little bit of time out of your day to hear about today's case. And like always, leave your theories and thoughts about the case down below in the comments. And of course, like always, leave some love down in the comments as well for the family. Remember that you can email me at gabbylosiscaserequests at gmail.com if you do have any cases that you want me to cover here on my channel. And I will see you all in the next one. Bye guys.